October the 30th, 1993. On this day, a Hollywood heartthrob will die from a massive overdose of cocaine and heroin. The call came in sometime after midnight. Uh, I came in as a seizure up on um, Sunset Boulevard at the Viper Room. and I literally cartwheeled over him. He was lying on the sidewalk getting resuscitated by paramedics. I didn't understand what had happened. You know, half an hour ago, he was, you know, seemingly no problem. And then boom. This is the story of the last 24 hours of River Phoenix. Los Angeles, Saturday, October the 30th, 1993. River Phoenix wakes early. To the world, he's Hollywood's golden boy. Vegan, ethically minded, squeaky clean. The truth is very different. For over two years, River has been struggling to overcome a drug problem. Today, that problem will overcome him. River is working on a film called Dark Blood. He's been on the film for two months and has stayed off drugs all that time. But when he arrives for the last day of filming, director George Slauser notices River is behaving strangely. There was a difference in, I say, body language. He could not judge distances perfectly well, and his walk was a little different than normal. He was someone who would never sit longer than, I think, 20 minutes without standing up from a chair. And that day, he sat maybe for an hour without moving from the chair. He had been taking drugs the night before. That was obvious. River has an on-again, off-again drug habit, but recently he's been finding that habit harder to manage. Until today, he's been clean on set, but it's been a struggle. I saw him during the shooting of Dark Blood. He was in bad shape during that. Um, and I think that had more to do with the drug problem at that point. But, uh, it was a difficult film. He was having a difficult time on it, trying to stop detoxing, the pressure of having to do the role when you're not physically ready. Um, it was a difficult, really difficult time for him. Now, for the first time on the shoot, it looks like River is losing the battle. And I got a call on my machine, and he says, uh, it's River. He said, maybe I can see over the weekend. He says, you know, I'm having a real hard time keeping my head above water. He says, in this crazy business. It was the first time I ever heard any uncertainty in River's voice. So far, River Phoenix has had a charmed passage through Hollywood. Now, on the set of his 14th film, he's coming apart. River was nine years old when his family moved to Hollywood. By the time he was 15, he was already getting noticed. He just had something special. The first time I laid eyes on River Phoenix was when I was casting my movie, uh, Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. I'd come from lunch and somebody said, well, you're going to meet this kid named River. I said, River, is that his real name? And they said, she said, yeah. I said, well, she said, River Phoenix. I said, whoa, what a name. And I walked into the little reception area and this kid stood up. And as he walked over towards me, I saw this light around him. And it was like, it was like a halo and it was an aura. I mean, and I, all of this, happened within seconds. I just said, this is a star. It was River's performance in the hit movie Stand By Me that thrust him into the limelight. Overnight, he became a teen idol. His face was on the cover of magazine after magazine, and he was getting thousands of fan letters every week. 
But River was more than just a pretty face. He could act, too. Every single take was excellent. You, you only did one take, or two maximum, and the enthusiasm and the intensity was there, so he was inspiring everybody else. People wanted to be around River. I don't think I ever felt that something was false or fakey. I'm quite sensitive, I guess, to people who are either theatrical in the wrong way or are just saying lines which they don't understand or don't mean, you know, they don't know. It's, it has a lot to do with, the, you know, the pauses you make when you talk and, 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 and how your voice goes and so on and how, I would say, the body and the voice and the arms and the feet and everything and the eyes are in sync are all one thing when you think or feel one thing. You know, your feet should feel it too. You know, if you don't, then you're, act, you're acting the wrong way. And so, and River, in that sense, was, a, was absolutely an actor because I felt that his whole body was participating. Soon, River was on Hollywood's A-list. He was Oscar-nominated for his role in Running on Empty, and his part in My Own Private Idaho won him the Best Actor Award at the Venice Film Festival. After just a few years in Hollywood, River was earning almost a million dollars a movie, and he was a pin-up the world over. But for River, the money and the recognition was not enough in itself. He wanted really to be good in what he did. So at that level, you might say that his fame and his success was an adversary to his peace you know, and that he was being seen. And also, knowing that his family came more and more to depend on him because he was the main breadwinner for a clan. Aged 17, River found himself supporting his parents, four brothers and sisters, paid staff, and hangers-on. He was the golden child who went to Hollywood, became a movie star, and so he had the pressure of having to support his family, um, to support, to bring in income. I can only imagine that it presents a kind of pressure that, you know, that, you know, so when the work stops and you're like, ooh, what am I going to do next? What's the, where's the next job coming from? I know I'll get something, but, you know, what do I do in my downtime, you know? How do I take the pressure off? I think that's another avenue where, you know, partying and drinking and, you know, having that kind of life can really, um, you know, present itself and as a healthy alternative. You know, this kind of like, oh, I need this because I'm going to have to go back to work again soon and I'm going to have to stay clean for that and I'm going to have to, you know, I just want to be me for the, the small period of time and I just want to have the pressure off. Um, he, you know, he had a lot of pressure. He had, it's a big family to have to support and to feed and to, um, to house and clothe. The pressure on his young shoulders was enormous and from time to time he needed to escape. Music was one release. He would jam for hours late into the night, often falling asleep over his guitar. The other way he relieved the pressure was to take drugs. River had the money and the freedom to do whatever he wanted, and his friends knew he had to be watched. With River, you always had, you know, someone had to be there. Someone had to chaperone his drug use, and if they didn't chaperone his drug use, it was dangerous. It was always dangerous. <laughs> River has been on the set of the movie Dark Blood for eight hours. He's on edge, feeling terrible after a late night taking drugs, and so far today, all he's done is sit and wait. It took us all day to set it up, because we had just come back to LA, and we had other sets, and, and so, you know, the actress had to wait around most of the day for this one scene. Director George Slauser is watchful of his star. I felt that had to be sure that everything was going to go OK. You know, it's like you have a, it's a bit silly to say, but you know, if you have someone who's sick, then you might take a long, you know, to sit down somewhere. You take care a little more because you don't know exactly how things will develop. First position, please. Finally, the cameras are ready to roll. It's time for River to perform. But of all the scenes he's ever done, the next is the one he's come to dread. He'd long idolized his co-star, Judy Davis, but now he was getting the chance to work with her, she seemed to be doing everything she could to make his life a misery. Good. 
Good, good. She was very difficult to work with, and we had a bad relationship. I was very irritated by the way she treated River, by making it difficult for him to act, whispering instead of talking, or when you could help, not helping. Yeah. The only time I suffered uh, through an actress, I've never had any problems with actors ever before in my career, but she, she, she made up for 40 years or something, or 30 years, because she was in, in a kind of way impossible, and she made it tough for River also. They complained to me many times that she was making it tough for him. River was so sensitive, and I don't think that he'd maybe experienced even until that particular movie, people that weren't kind to him at some level. River felt the antagonism deeply. He phoned friends in tears. Yet for seven long weeks, he endured it, asking George Slauser to postpone the love scenes. He asked me, can I play the scene the last day because I don't feel like doing it halfway or touching her and whatever. I mean, he was, uh, he said, you know, I'd get, I'm getting goose pimples if I, you know, I have to, 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 to touch her arm. Now the scene can be delayed no longer. It'll be the last of River's short life. And in just a few hours, he'll take the drugs that will leave him fighting for his life on an L.A. sidewalk. <laughs> River Phoenix has 16 hours to live. He's on the set of his last film, Dark Blood, and he's in a bad way. He's edgy and nervous about the next scene. It's a love scene with Judy Davis, a woman he says makes his skin crawl. But so far, three takes are in the can, and River has held it together. Now, it's take four. Mark it, mark. Train. Action. Somebody's gonna die. Believe me. Cut. The scene is over and the shot should have ended when the director shouted cut. But when the crew gathered the two days later, after River had died, they realized something very strange had happened. At the end of the fourth take, it was cut, wrap, to print. The lights came down and River became this perfect silhouette lit by these candles, almost like you're in a church. River walked up to the camera and stood there for about five seconds. And then I had realized, oh, the camera was still rolling, and I turned it off. River died just hours after this shot was taken. It was the eeriest thing I've ever experienced through my camera. It still gives me the chills. Filming over, River leaves set for the night, but the day's events have left him shaken. River was emotionally fragile. The smallest thing could upset him. This vulnerability had its roots in River's childhood. River spent his early years on the road in Latin America. He wasn't River Phoenix then, he was River Bottom. His parents, John and Arlen Bottom, were missionaries for a Christian cult called the Children of God. River's dad, John, held the grand title Archbishop of Venezuela and the Caribbean. They went wherever God sent them. Mexico, Puerto Rico, Venezuela. It was an unsettled existence. They had no friends, no home. Often struggling to make ends meet, they trusted in God to provide. Actually, it was often River. At the age of five, he and his younger sister, Rain, were busking on the streets to feed the family. After three years on the road, his parents had had enough. In Caracas, they threw themselves on the mercy of Father Stephen Wood. I was at that time pastor of this church and had been a friend of the children of God for many years. And this family showed up saying that they were leaving the children of God and needed help. They uh, had decided that they could no longer accept 
the directions they were receiving from headquarters. They found them increasingly at odds with what they read in the Bible. The children of God would later become notorious for their ideas about sex. Teaching that sex was just another way of showing God's love, couples often swapped partners. Children were encouraged to sleep in the same bed as their parents while they made love, and children were to be initiated into sexual practices at the age of four. Whether River was involved in any sexual practices has never been ascertained. His close friends refused to talk about it. Soon after these practices were advocated, his parents wanted out, but their decision left them stranded. They found themselves in a foreign country with absolutely no funds, no place to live, no money to buy food for their children, and no way to get back to the United States, which was their goal. They asked for hospitality and help. Uh, meanwhile, they were going to try to, to earn enough to eat out of and then to see how they would somehow get back to the US. Father Wood gave them room and board, and in exchange, River and Rain performed Christian songs during Sunday service. The most uh, well-known was that uh, you've got to be a baby. But River sang it not just in Spanish, but also in English, French. He sang it in Japanese and Swahili. I'm not sure that he was all that great of a singer, but he was a little kid. He was a great entertainer in his singing. Uh, and the fact that he could even play this huge guitar, this guitar that was so much bigger than him was impressive. It was our most popular service, and it was literally uh, standing room only. Uh, but he had the attention of absolutely everyone, while his little sister was out kind of working the crowd. I think on the streets where they had been trained, uh, she would be going around asking for money. But here it was just kind of get the people to clap and to sing along. After four months, Father Wood found the family a way back to Florida on a cargo ship. On arrival, they changed their name to Phoenix to symbolize a new beginning. But River's early years would leave their mark. He told me he suffered from the upbringing. I guess part of his, you know, vulnerability and fragility, which is also part of which why he's a good actor, is maybe due to that background. You can become strong because you have this kind of tough childhood, or you can get, obviously, uh, traumatized. <laughs> so I think it's a bit of both. River was vulnerable. He took the knocks of everyday life hard, and drugs were an easy escape. River Phoenix has just six hours left to live. He's had a tough day on the set of his latest film, Dark Blood. But now he's back at his hotel where he can let go with his family and friends. Dickie Rood has been a close friend of Rivers for two years. He was just in good spirits, you know. His family was around, his brother and his sister and his girlfriend, and he was happy to be, you know, off of the set. Things were jovial. <laughs> Dickie's wife, Abby, is Rivers' personal assistant. Samantha Mathis has been dating River for the last six months. Yeah, he's good, he's good. <laughs> and some of River's family have flown in to see him. Joaquin, his only brother, is here. And so is Rain, River's sister who shares his passion for music. Yeah, Rainbow Leaf, Liberty Summer, they loved River dearly. He, he, was, he was the best older brother ideal you could imagine, you know nurturing, caring, protecting, and would go to him for advice. And he had, you know, a great deal of experience with all of their, their emotions and, and differences. There's no sign now of the stress he was under earlier on set. It was, a, it was a normal, like, welcome back to L.A. type of atmosphere. He was great. He seemed to be completely on his mark. There was no, there was no clue as to any kind of haywire going on or potential for that. So far today, River has stayed clean, and that's the plan for the night ahead. 
He wants to keep a clear head because he's been asked to play at one of LA's coolest new clubs, the Viper Room. River is due to appear alongside one of his music heroes, but tragically, he'll never make it onto the stage. The movies dominated River's teenage life. They had to, they were his family's bread and butter. But River had grown up playing music. It was his all-consuming passion. When he wasn't working as an actor on my movie, he was playing the guitar or he was writing music. He was always creating. I remember going to his room a lot of times and it was music books and, and song and notes and everything for his music. Because one of the memories I have is River's hair hanging down over his face and River hanging over a guitar. And so I remember seeing him a lot working on his music because he loved music. According to him, it meant to him more than the acting. Like for him, the music, he was more into music than into um, being an actor. He wanted to be a musician. At 17, he got the chance to do just that. The family moved to Gainesville, a hippie town in Florida famous for its music scene. They bought a large ranch just outside the town and employed Dirk Drake as the family tutor. And when Dirk first met River, he recognized a passion for music. I uh, pulled up into the driveway and there was a room that perhaps had been a garage, I'm not sure, but had big sliding glass doors, and I got out looking around. And when I came through, this teenage kid pops up, and he's got an Ovation guitar, and he's all excited to show me the engineering of it. I just remember thinking, this kid's a musician. He's, he's so on it, and it was so important to him to share that guitar with me. had a thriving music scene in the mid-1980s. This was the first place that the emerging punk rock, post-punk rock scene was happening. And I think putting the band together uh, was a, a primary focus in coming here and finding musicians that would be complementary to the songs he'd written and the tastes that he had. In 1988, River formed Alec is Attic with his younger sister, Rain. He threw himself into writing, turned the garage into a rehearsal studio, and booked the band on a two-week tour of the East Coast. He put everything into the band and secured a two-year development deal with Island Records. If, in that time, the band could produce a good demo tape, they would finance an album. The band was River's plan for the future, and he desperately wanted to be taken seriously as a musician. I was very difficult for River because he didn't want his name or his movie star status attached to his band's gigs. And it never seemed to fail. They'd get a gig at a club, and the proprietors of the club, I guess, eager to get people through the gate, mentioned, you know, River Phoenix and his sister Rainbow. It was disappointing because he wanted his music to be taken for the music and not the music of the Hollywood star. Any chance River got to prove that he wasn't just a teen actor with rock star pretensions he leapt at. On his last day, he'd get such a chance. <laughs> is letting his hair down after being on set all day. He and his friends have left their hotel and are hitting the town. Just after midnight, Samantha, Rain, Joaquin and River arrive at the Viper Room, Johnny Depp's club on Sunset Strip. River has brought his guitar. In the corner of the club sits a small stage. Tonight, Johnny Depp's band will be playing. Among the lineup is Flea, bass player for the Red Hot Chili Peppers and one of River's closest friends. River's planning to get up on stage and jam with some of the best musicians in town. For this, he's staying clean. Pleasant Gaiman, LA columnist, is also in the crowd. It was very smoky and very crowded. It was a mixture of Hollywood hipsters and band people and people that just wanted to see Johnny Depp play in a band. You know, just, you know, some giggling, teeny boppy kind of girls. The rock scene then was really fertile in Los Angeles. It was. Uh, you know, there's a really hugely thriving underground rock scene, and uh, the clubs had a decent 
crowd. They were very crowded, but they weren't overpacked with just people milling around not knowing what the hell was going on. The Viper Room, it was actually one of the first, like, cool clubs that was trying not to be an underground shithole. There was, like, big, burly, giant security men there with earpieces and the whole velvet rope mentality, and it was really um, excessive. It was really Hollywood. It was really just gross. Samantha, Rain, Joaquin and River find a booth at the back of the club. River's waiting to get on stage. The lineup tonight will include Al Jorgensen of Ministry, Gibby Haynes of the Butthole Surfers, and of course Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, oh yeah. River's happy. He's staying away from uh, drugs so he can jam with his close friend Flea. But that's not thanks. going to happen. River and Flea had been great friends since they met three years earlier on the set of My Own Private Idaho. Flea, a sometime actor, had a small part in the film. Filming began in Portland, Oregon, and almost immediately, cast and crew realized they were involved in something special. They worked hard, they played hard. River and many of the younger actors moved into director Gus Van Sant's house. The day's work on set would be followed by jam sessions late into the night. This footage was shot by River's friend, Matt Ebert. When he and Flea met on Idaho, you know, they got along like, you know, brother and brother. Like, they just went arm in arm into the sunset with it. Like, they just, you know, played guitar together and really, like, you know, became really close friends almost immediately. Flea was fascinated by River's talents as an actor, and River is a fantastic actor who is wanting to be a musician, so it's a natural attraction and a natural source of friendship and learning for each other. He loved him. He loved Flea. River was crazy about Flea. From this moment on, River and Flea became inseparable, and on his last day, Flea would be with River until the very end. Inside the Viper Room, River has made his way to the stage. He's expecting to join the band, but there's a problem. Homicide detective Mike Lee later pieced together the events of the evening. What's going on? What? When he arrived there, uh, there were more than enough musicians, as there quite often is in, in that type of a situation, so he could not get up onto the stage and, and play that particular night. Well, I got good news and bad news. I heard through some of the people that we talked with that uh, Flea was the one who said, no, you can't come up and play. play bass. Mr. Yeah. Phoenix was disappointed that uh, he wasn't able to get up on him, join in the jam session, and because of that disappointment, he elected to get into the drugs. River idolized Flea as a person and a musician and was excited about playing side by side with him on stage. Now he's been shut out, he retreats into the crowd and begins to look for drugs. If you were of a mind that you wanted to go in and party with drugs, they were available. And, you know, it was your choice, whatever you wanted to do. It was not at all hard to find uh, drugs out on the strip. There was drugs everywhere. Probably the main things were cocaine and heroin. Plus, at the age of early to mid-20s, you still have the hallowed misconception that you're immortal, you know? You still look pretty. You, you don't really get a hangover, you know? I mean, you can, sure, I can do all of this, you know? It's not gonna have any consequences. All right, all right, you know what? I know what you need. I know what you need. So I know that uh, he was disappointed. And being disappointed in something will, uh, I think we've all been there, where instead of reaching over and closing the door, you sometimes slam the door. River is about to take the drugs that will kill him. My own private Idaho introduced River to Flea. It was also where his drug use first became dangerous. 
By 1989, River had played some interesting roles, but they were all safe, chosen for him by his mother and agent as suitable for the River Phoenix image. Yet River longed for something different, dangerous and adult, longed for a role he could call his own. The script for My Own Private Idaho offered that role. This was an art house film about male prostitutes based on a play by Shakespeare, about as different and edgy as River could have hoped for. It was very, very cool at that point in time in, in youth culture to focus on the dark side and focus on the beautiful loser and, and the, the, the romantic lost boys and girls of our culture. And River was attracted to that and curious about it. And this was his chance to jump into it. His character, Mike Waters, was a heroin-addicted rent boy, and River was determined to do the part justice. With his personal assistant, Matt Ebert, River spent days hanging with rent boys on the streets of Portland, Oregon. Now we're mixing ourselves up with street kids and, you know, boys and girls, young boys and girls, and the drug element is there. We have dealers, we have, um, we have Johns, we have, you know, the, we're kind of on the underbelly of all of Portland, trying to scrape, you know, scrape up some history. We're going to bookshops and, you know, little bathhouses and, you know, looking for any kind of CD. We're looking for it because we have to recreate it. We have to, you know, do it and we want to do it right. We don't want to just, you know, invent, you know, this for, for an audience. We want to create, we want to create, we want to reflect it. Um, and we want to do it honestly. He was really into research. He was very big on like, okay, I gotta learn all about these characters. We'd go into the, what they call Vaseline Alley, and we'd meet street hustlers, and we'd take them home and we'd interview them. Here I am walking in the motel room in my bathtub. Uh, I stand next to you, and I say, uh, you gonna take your pants off. Mm -hmm. what, what is your reaction? Mind-boggling stuff, you know, like the life, the lives you would run into with this. And you're thinking, you know, here I am with this, we're actually doing, you know, trying to find out what it's like to do that, you know, what these kids actually have to go through. And a lot of it was really painful, you know? And I think that, while it can feed an actor, it also can be dangerous, you know? The closer you come to a really dangerous environment and a situation, the closer that environment gets to you, too. One of the fundaments of acting is research, you know? There's a certain amount you can bring from within, but then there's a, a, a lot you need from without. And when we were on the streets of Idaho and, you were, and he was acting and we were all acting with street kids who were literally heroin addicts and you knew they were heroin addicts because they had tracks in their hands and they talked about it on the film. So that River would try that would be, I can't imagine him not trying that actually. I mean, I, being as young as he was and as brave as he was. River had drunk before, smoked some dope, snorted some coke, but always in moderation. Now he knew no restraints. As the parties at Gus's rolled on night after night, his drug use escalated. Xanax, Valium, Vicodin, Percodan, Percocet, you know, drug after drug after pill after pill after pill, smoking pot, drinking alcohol, snorting cocaine, snorting heroin or smoking heroin. We did a lot of drugs. <laughs> you know, we did a lot of drugs. What had started as character research was now becoming much more dangerous. We're not made of Teflon. We're skin and bones. And, um, you know, I think that's when... You know, that's when his addiction really started to take off. However hard he battled it, the urge would always be there. In moments of stress or anxiety, the temptation would be hard to resist. The Viper Room, the club which will become infamous in less than one hour, is nearing capacity as Johnny Depp's band gets going. Upset that he couldn't get on stage and jam with Flea, Rivers scored some drugs. He heads into the bathroom to collect. Here he is coming off a period of a dry spell where he's working on a movie that's not going well and he's frustrated and he needs release and he needs to relax and all he can think of to do is, you know, go out and get loaded. 
Rain, Joaquin and Rivers' girlfriend, Samantha Mathis, are in a booth at the back of the club. They're completely unaware of the horror that's about to unfold. He ingested a quantity of drug uh, that appeared to be heroin and cocaine in powder form. It appears that it was snorted, and the reaction was almost immediate. River has snorted a speedball, cocaine and heroin mixed together. When it works, it works great. When it doesn't work, you die. That's like Russian roulette. Oh, yeah. Several sources told me that uh, the words were, uh, this is too much, uh, or words oh, to that effect, too much, too much. River is clearly in trouble. Someone offers him a Valium to calm him down. His heart is beating wildly, misfiring, the cocaine causing it to race out of control, the heroin telling it to slow. He stumbles out into the bar. He has just one hour to live. River's drug habit really took hold after my own private Idaho. He began to spend more and more time in LA. Part of the reason was his growing friendship with Flea, but L.A. was dangerous for River. The crowds he ran with partied hard. It's hard to be young and cool and hip in Los Angeles with money and time and shitloads of exotic drugs at your disposal. There's a point at which drug, sex, rock and roll can be personally, maybe culturally, artistically rewarding, and there's a point where they can be very destructive. And River was finding those boundaries. More often than not, River was crossing those boundaries. My band, the Ringling Sisters, was holding a... We used to do annual orphanage benefits. Anyway, at one of them, we were having at the Roxy. There was a really cute boy passed out backstage in the hallway and just getting worse and worse, like sweating and just, you know, looking like he wasn't getting up. And I was, like, running around being a stage manager and making, you know, doing raffles with the audience and stuff, and finally, I like looked down and I'm like, who is that really cute and really fucked up boy that's laying on the floor? We have to get him out of here. And someone said, that's River Phoenix. I'm like, that's River Phoenix? Jesus. In the periods between Idaho and going back to Oregon to work on Evening Cowgirls Get the Blues and seeing him then, you know, it was taking its toll. He was, the drugs were definitely beating him down. And, um, you know, his skin was getting bad, his hair was getting bad. Everything just looked rougher and, you know, more ripped up. River's family were concerned about his visible deterioration and confronted him. But River refused to admit he had a problem. They were such a, um, a, a beautiful spiritual family and so supportive of him in so many ways. But, um, you know, like most families, I think a little painfully unaware of the, um, the realities that he was going through in terms of the drug addiction. The family home had always been River's refuge. It was a place he could rest, recuperate and clean up. But life at home had changed. The family was now attracting hordes of hangers-on. Many of them had drug habits and just wanted to party with the young movie star. Temptation was everywhere. I turned to River and said, you know, a lot of these people are not very well educated and they're completely reactionary and they're just partying hardy and living a glamorous life from one moment to the next and if they're fucking their lives up, it's not your responsibility and you shouldn't enable that. And if they're fucking your life up, then it's your responsibility to, to detach yourself from that. By his last year, River was working hard to clean up his act, but the temptation was always there. Clean periods were always followed by a binge. River's life became a struggle. Those months were tough. They were tough on everybody who was hovering around the, the supernova, you know, because it all of a sudden just exploded and was gone.
Inside the Viper room, River has just taken a massive overdose of cocaine and heroin. His body is struggling to survive, but he can still be saved. He just needs help fast. River Phoenix has less than an hour to live. He's gone to the Viper Room on LA's Sunset Strip. His sister Rain, brother Joaquin, and girlfriend Samantha Mathis are in a booth drinking. They think River's on stage getting ready to jam with friends. Actually, he's been shut out of the jam session and, disappointed, has just snorted a massive speedball, cocaine and heroin combined. River's body has gone into shock. It's one thing to use your to use heroin and cocaine and everything on a daily basis. Your your system becomes used to it. Your tolerance stays the same. But when you start and stop and start and stop and start and stop and then always go back to where you left off, you run the risk of overdosing and killing yourself. He was a kid. Kids make mistakes. Back at the table, River's having a difficult time. What's going on? It's obvious he's not feeling well, but no one's aware of the effects that the drugs are having on his internal organs. Toxicologist Dan Anderson later analyzed River's blood. There was a very significant amount of heroin and cocaine in his system. There was so much cocaine there, it's astronomical. Um, it's eight times what we consider lethal. He either didn't realize the purity of the drug and took his standard amount that he normally took, or he took way too much. A body can only tolerate so much. Um, and after that tolerance is over with, you're going to die of the drug. What started out as a fun family reunion is rapidly turning into a nightmare. By his last year, River's drug use had hit its peak. Friends and family pleaded with him to get clean. He started to listen, and the periods between binges grew longer. He began working on a new music project with Sasa Raphael. In April, River was approached about a new film, Dark Blood, but there were worries that his drug use had taken too large a toll and he needed to rest. I called River more or less every two weeks when he was in Florida and I wanted to know if he was okay and if he was uh, still in a good mood, if he still liked the story. A little bit, if you want, to, yeah. not to check, but to feel how he was. And I was aware, obviously, that he had been taken drugs before. Uh, I was hoping that he would be, you know, I would say, calm. River's father, John, had recently moved to a farm in Costa Rica but he realized there was a problem and intervened. His father flew up um, from his farm, and he never does that. He did, at this time, he was just like, was not interested in coming to this part of the world at all. But he flew up specifically to convince his son not to, not to go film the next move. John was just saying, give it a break. You know, I, I, I would hope that you can get back to the garden. Take a break. Don't do any more projects for a while. Come live in Costa Rica. Work in the garden. Let's get back to being a family. But River wanted to work with co-star Judy Davis, whom he admired so much. And he was the family breadwinner. He had some 30 people to support. He decided to do the movie. For seven weeks, the cast and crew of Dark Blood lived and worked in the middle of the Utah desert. All that time, River stayed clean. I was quite busy, so that there were many times when I started to get the feeling I am so busy with, you know, the preparation of the shoot and the, and the cameras and the this and the that, that I was not spending maybe enough time with River. Finally, the location wrapped, and the production was moved back to L.A. for two weeks in the studio. River was heading back to Partyland. He took his leave from director George Slauser. 
before leaving, he said, OK, bye. Uh, going back to the bad, bad town of L.A. And I didn't realize what he meant with the word bad. Unfortunately, only after his death, I started to understand what the implications were in the word for him. Four days later, River would snort the speedball that killed him. <laughs> Inside the club, River has been suffering badly from a drug overdose, vomiting and passing out. At first, Rain and Joaquin weren't aware of just how bad things had got, but as his condition worsens, they drag him outside for some air. As soon as River's body hits the street, he goes into seizures. The vegan with the squeaky clean image is now dying of a drug overdose. The people around him at that time, it was, they were, you know, it was a kid, his brother, young kid, Joaquin, and stuff, and he's dying in front of them, and they don't know what to do. And the people in the bar don't know what to do. They watch this celebrity move around, and they watch this famous person. Do we say something is happening to this famous person? The fame itself kept him from getting what he needed to live. Whether the fact that River is a celebrity, or the fact that drugs are involved, or the fact that they're terrified by this sudden turn of events, the result is the same. No one calls for an ambulance for a full five minutes. Finally, Joaquin takes action. All 911 calls are recorded. This is Joaquin's call. Yeah, he's having seizures on Sunset Larrabee. Please come here. OK, calm down a little bit, OK? What's the address where you need us? It's Sunset and Larrabee. It's at the Viper Room. He's laying on the cement. Is he breathing? I don't know. The last I checked, they said he was breathing. Is he fucking breathing? I don't know if he's breathing. Please, he can't okay. get over here. Where's the ambulance? Who's, who's with him right now? My sister and some people. Your sister? Yeah. OK, can you talk to her from where you are? Oh, I got him. She's trying to give him mouth to mouth. Please, get to over here. Please. Calm down, OK? Please. Sir, calm down. Tell her not to give him mouth. It's four more minutes before the paramedics arrive. River is lying still. His seizures have stopped and his breathing is shallow. The speedball is attacking his heart. Beating wildly out of sync, his heart is failing, pumping little or no blood. He's running out of time. River Phoenix was lying on the sidewalk, uh, unresponsive, uh, with a couple of friends around him. And he was pulseless, he was non breathing, and had no heart activity. We immediately started CPR innovated him to control his airway and uh, started an IV and uh, gave him a series of drugs to, in an attempt to restart his heart. Back at the Hotel Nico, two of River's closest friends, Dickie and Abby Rude, have no idea their friend is in trouble. We got a phone call at the hotel, a hysterical phone call. Uh, I can't remember from who whether it was his brother or his sister. We jumped in the car and rushed up the street. It wasn't that far away, but it was a, it was a terrifying shock. A terrifying shock to see your best friend uh, lying on the sidewalk with paramedics standing over him and a crowd of people around dressed up in Halloween costumes. And it was just incomprehensible for me. Having failed to restart his heart, the paramedics prepare to transport the lifeless young actor to the closest emergency room. News of the incident has spread into the club. Flea runs outside and demands to travel with River to the hospital. But it's too late for River Jude Phoenix. He's pronounced dead at 1.51 a.m. October 31st, 1993. I remember when I heard about it. I remember where I was. I remember being just devastated, you know, that he died that way, you know. And I was surprised, despite thinking that I wouldn't be surprised. I've heard people say it was his time and he was ready to go, and that's bullshit. That's bullshit. He loved life and he cherished and nurtured life around him, and I'm sure his own would have been right there with it as something cherished and nurtured. 
I went with his sister and we brought his ashes home. And I, um, I don't remember this as long as I live. I gave his ashes to his mother and she held them like a baby. And it was uh, one of the most tragic things I've ever seen in my life. He's become a kind of mystical being in people's lives, somebody that inspires them, not because of his tragedy, but because of th that quality that he had, which was always spiritual, so that when you see him, that magical thing didn't die with him. He was a good friend. He brought out the best in you. And uh, I miss him a lot.